Okay, so welcome uh, to Theories of Personality. Uh, we will be uh, starting week three today, and we're going to be talking about uh, Carl Jung, um, his theory of personality. Now, it's the neo-psychoanalytic approach. Remember, Freud's approach is the, the psychoanalytic approach. Neo means new, so the new psychoanalytic approach. Um, Jung is what we called a neo-Freudian, a new Freudian. There, were, there are several individuals who are considered neo-Freudians. People who lived around the time of Freud and knew Freud, were followers of Freud, and eventually broke away and proposed their own theories. And their theories have some things in common with Freud's theory. So they're called um, neo-Freudians or you know, the neo-psychoanalytic approach. So let's get started. Let's talk about uh, some terms here that uh, have to do with Jung's theory. At the beginning, uh, it's, it's gonna sound like we're talking about physics and not really psychology. So we're gonna talk about psychic energy, opposites, equivalence, entropy. Those are all terms that are used in physics, uh, you know, but uh, it'll, it'll look more like personality as we, as we get uh, further into, um, into this theory. Um, uh, Jung's uh, approach, by the way, is called analytics psychology. So it says there, Carl Jung's analytic psychology. That's, that's what it's called. Um, Jung called, uh, uh, you know, the, our personality, he called it the psyche. Okay. So you hear that term several times. It just means personality. Your psyche is your personality. And then we have the term right there, libido again, which is a term that Freud used. Um, the libido is, uh, you know, it basically is, uh, is uh, basically psychic energy. Uh, psychic energy is basically energy that's kind of diffused. That means it's widespread. So kind of a general life tendency that fuels the psyche. So the energy that fuels the psyche, that fuels your personality uh, is psychic energy. Or to put it simply, you know, as the, the libido. Uh, Freud, remember, calls it this sort of life energy. It's a similar idea here, okay? But uh, for Jung, it does a little bit more than just drive, you know, those things that are biological that have to do with reproduction and, and mating and, you know, and getting together and forming relationships. Uh, for Jung, uh, you know, this psychic energy, this libido also drives psychological activities, like perceiving, basically, understanding what you're looking at, thinking, feeling, and wishing. It doesn't just drive you know, motivations that have to do with reproduction, forming groups and things like that. It also has to do with psychological things, things that are just, you know, uh, that have to do more with your personality. Uh, example here, if you're highly motivated to attain power, that means power has high psychic value and there's a lot of energy devoted to seeking it. I will come up to this idea of power uh, several times in, in talking about uh, uh, Jung's uh, theory. But the libido, psychic energy, energy that drives basically our activities, not just things that have to do with reproduction, not just things that have to do directly with promoting the species and life, but also uh, things that are more psychological. Um, some uh, principles here or some ideas that have to do with, uh, with uh, Jung's theory. There's the principle of opposites. Uh, this just means that everything has an opposite, okay? Uh, there are opposites when it comes to psychic energy. Like for instance, every wish or feeling has an opposite. And when something ha has an opposite, that means it generates conflict, it generates energy, it generates tension. An example here, right? Uh, power is something that people can seek that has a lot of psychic energy, right? A lot of psychic values, a lot of energy devoted to it. Um, and uh, power has an opposite. There's power versus no power. There's a big difference between being powerful and not being powerful. In this country specifically, uh, but also in a lot of other countries, okay? Being powerful is, uh, is very different than having no power. And because there's such a difference, because there is this opposite, okay? That creates basically a, a drive to achieve one or the other. It makes it so that power has high psychic value because having no power means there's gonna be very different circumstances for you. So the greater the difference between power and no power, the more we are driven to attain more, I mean, one more than the other, the more value that one, one has. Makes a big difference 
in this country and in most countries to be powerful, right? Versus not being powerful. You're treated very, very differently. Uh, let's keep going. There's also the principle of equivalence. Energy that is not, uh, that is not uh, used in one area will be shifted to another, okay? So that's the principle of equ equivalence. It has to do with uh, what is called conservation of energy uh, in physics. So energy is neither created nor destroyed. It is merely shifted from one thing to another. So the energy that you use for conscious activities, like learning and thinking or whatever you're doing, um, that energy is used for conscious activity uh, when you're awake um, is shifted to the unconscious when you're asleep. When you're asleep, that energy is shifted to things that are unconscious, things like dreaming, okay? Uh, so the energy doesn't go away. It doesn't, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't get destroyed. It, uh, it is merely shifted from one activity uh, to another. Just like with, um, please have your mics off. Uh, I don't wanna hear any background noise. Um, yeah, the energy is, is shifted. Uh, it, similar thing happens like when you're going to school or you're, and you're going to work, right? When you're at work, you use your energy there. And then when you come to school, let's say if you go to school, then you use your energy for that and you shift the energy from one thing to another. And also you can do it, you know, in daytime, nighttime, when you're awake, when you're asleep, the energy uh, doesn't go away, it's just shifted. There's also the principle of enthropy, which means that the psyche's energy, you know, the energy for your, that drives your personality flows to maintain a balance, okay? Uh, if desires differ greatly in intensity, that means the energy will flow from the stronger to the weaker. Okay. Um, perfect balance within the system means there's no energy. So remember, there are opposites, and this creates tension. This this creates energy, and uh, the principle of entropy says that basically uh, the energy will flow from the stronger to the weaker. Uh, first, it goes to the stronger, and then eventually it will flow back. So here's an example to help you understand. Uh, let's say there's a desire for wealth because um, you know you have a desire for wealth but you also have a desire for relaxation right so you want to be driven you want to accomplish things right you want to make something of yourself you want to become wealthy and powerful let's say but you also want to relax you also want to take it easy if the desire for wealth is stronger uh, and it often is then initially more energy will be used to seek wealth maybe you'll go to school you'll work hard or maybe you'll start a business but you'll do something to try to attain this wealth. Later, when wealth has been attained, the energy will flow back to the other and it will flow back to instead trying to take it easy and trying to relax. Uh, and wealth will no longer be a great motivator. That's what happens when we seek things. We seek things at the expense of other things. We may seek you know, money and power at the expense, for instance, of, uh, of relationships and friendships. And as we attain one thing we have trained wealth and power or whatever it is uh, then later on we'll shift that energy back to the other things that have been neglected so that's the principle of entropy energy flows to maintain a balance it shifts from one to the other um, more about this um so that sounded like physics okay but it'll be um It'll be clear soon that, is, that we're, it's not physics. We're still talking about personality. Uh, remember that Jung is a neo-Freudian or uh, a, it's called the neo-psychoanalytic approach. Uh, so there's, a lot, there's several things about Jung's theory that are similar to Freud. Okay, like for instance, Jung also has something that's a part of his theory called the ego. And it's the same thing as Freud's ego, okay? It's basically the conscious part of personality. It's the part of you that thinks, you know, that perceives, that feels, remembers. The part of you that selects what you're going to attend to, what you focus on. It carries out the activities of, a, of your waking life, okay? So the ego keeps you focused on the lecture and keeps other info out of awareness. Just got a message that my battery is running low. So I am going, speaking of shifting energy, right? I'm going to have to shift move this table and I'm going to uh, 
have to move this laptop and plug it in. So the lecture is being disrupted a little bit, I know, right now. Let me uh, move this thing and just plug it in so the battery doesn't die. Uh, cheap laptop, I guess, doesn't have a long battery life. Or maybe it got drained overnight. But I charged it fully yesterday. I didn't charge it this morning. Okay, so we will continue. Uh, so the ego is like Freud's ego, basically. It's the part of you that thinks, that feels, that remembers. Um, it, it carries out uh, the, uh, you know, the activities of, the, of your waking life. Similar, similar to Freud, okay? The ego is just the part of you that thinks. It's not uh, really the unconscious here, okay? Uh, more about the ego. Um, but um, Freud has this idea, I'm uh, not Freud, uh, Jung has this idea about the ego a little bit more developed, more developed. It has more to do with other aspects of his personality theory, okay? Um, for instance, uh, according to Jung, the ego also determines the dominance of certain attitudes. For instance, like uh, extroversion and introversion. Those are attitudes that we have, you know, toward the world and toward ourselves. So for instance, extroversion, if you are extroverted, right? Um, with extroversion, the energy is directed outward, right? Toward others or the outside world. When you are extroverted, you seek the company of other people. Uh, you basically want to have friends. You want to go to parties. Uh, you're extroverted. You like the company of others. Your energy is directed toward others, toward things outside of you, okay? If you are introverted or, or you, you, know, you have introversion, that means the energy is directed more inward, more inward toward ourselves, okay? We focus more on our thoughts and what's happening with us rather than, what's, than, than other people. We prefer less friends, less company, less parties. We're more introverted. Okay, uh, so these are, these are attitudes that uh, you call these attitudes, extroversion and introversion. And the dominant attitude remains in consciousness and is more influential. The dominant one is the one that drives your, you know, your conscious mind, basically, the one that, uh, you know, that your ego kind of uh, chooses, so to speak. Okay, and that is what drives your behavior. But the non-dominant attitude, the other one isn't really... I, I mean, it's, it's less influential, but it isn't really gone, okay? The non-dominant attitude remains part of your unconscious. It's hidden and it's less influential. But you have both. It's just that one of these may be more dominant than the, than the other, okay? But the other one is there. You do, if you're introverted, mostly introverted, that means that's how you are most of the time. But you also have an extroverted side that maybe you don't show that often. Okay, because it's usually the, because the dom, your dominant side might be the introvert, introverted side of you. Um, it's the same thing with me. I considered myself to be more introverted, uh, but in the right occasions, during the right times, I can't be extroverted. But usually my extroverted side is kept in check and is not, uh, is not that influential. Usually my introverted side is more influential. Oops, it's a little bit too um, fast there. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. And uh, there's also four psychological functions. Uh, according to uh, according to you, four psychological functions have to do with this theory. Uh, there is, for instance, the function uh, of the psycholo psychological function known as sensing. It's a non-rational function based on incoming sensory information. It's not evaluated. Let me, let me explain that. Sensing is basically like uh, your senses, basically. You can see, you can hear, you can taste, touch, smell. So sensing is just a function where you basically use your senses. So you may sense a light in front of you, you hear a sound in the distance, you touch your hand, right? You smell something, you hear something. That is all sensing. These functions are not rational. They're not really about uh, you know, whether something is uh, right or wrong. Uh, you don't really evaluate them. It's not really about thinking. It's just something that you do. It's, uh, it's sensing. And there's also the function of intuiting. Intuiting is a little bit easier to understand. It's, it's just your intuition, your gut feeling. It's also non-rational, which means you don't really think about it. You don't really decide, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, good or bad. It's just your, your it's, it's really your gut feeling, right? Not based on any sensory information. It's just your intuition your gut feeling. You, so you have this, um, 
you know, this kind of, your intuition tells you that, uh, for instance, uh, you know, that maybe somebody is watching you. The, you may see or hear nothing, but it tells you someone is, someone is watching you. That's your intuition, your gut feeling. Uh, I can tell you that uh, modern research on this uh, thing called intuition suggests that it might still be based on your senses, that maybe you are uh, detecting information at a very low level of awareness, uh, at a non-conscious level, and that's all your intuition may be. Like maybe uh, your gut tells you someone is watching you, you don't see or hear anything, but maybe you are detecting something. Maybe you are detecting some smell or some sound at such a low level that you don't think there's anything there, but an at an unconscious level, there might be something that's being detected. But your intuition, as uh, Jung understood stood it, it's just your gut feeling. It's just something that tells you something, but you don't really understand why. There's also thinking. Thinking is easy to understand. Thinking is a rational function. It means you know something, okay? Rational function that allows you to determine if something is true or false. So with thinking, you do evaluate things, right? Something is true or false, right or wrong, right? It's thinking, you think about things, like you know a bug is an in insect. That is thinking, okay? And then there's also the rational function, I'm the, yeah, the rational function known as feeling. Feeling, right, um, allows you to determine the quality of something. Something is pleasant, unpleasant, stimulating, dull, you like it, you dislike it. Um, so with feeling, it's a rational function because you do evaluate, you, deter you do determine if it's good or bad, right or wrong, but it's more of a feeling, like you feel the class is boring. Now that's not the same thing as your intuition. Your intuition is a gut feeling, okay? Um, and with feeling, we're talking about like we're talking about being emotional, something like that, okay? You like something, you dislike it, pleasant, unpleasant, uh, you know, good, bad, that kind of stuff. It's, it's more about emotion. Your gut feeling is not really about emotion, it's just intuition. Um, I know that this doesn't sound like much yet, but we're gonna, you'll see very soon that, that this will be, uh, become very interesting and become more about personality. So here, Here's the thing, if you combine the two attitudes, extroversion or introversion, with the, two psych with the four psychological functions, sensing, uh, intuition, thinking, or feeling, if you combine those, you get eight psychological types, eight possibilities. Uh, it says, see page 94. You know what, it's not page 94 anymore. I've, um, I have changed textbooks and uh, well, it's not page 94 anymore, and I keep forgetting to uh, update that. But two possibilities, extroversion, introversion, times four other possibilities, sensing, intuition, thinking, and feeling, two times four gives you eight, eight different possibilities if you do the math. And, I'm, and we're gonna go the, over those eight psychological types. Think of them as your, these are the personality types, okay? You can have these different kinds of personality. And by the way, um, you, you know, it's just a matter of which one is stronger. You're not purely one or the other, but you might be more one of these than the other. You might be 80% one and 10% another and 10% another, or, you know, or maybe, you know, 60% one and then 20 and 10 and 10. So it depends. You can have a combination of things, but usually there's one that is stronger. So you might be the extroverted sensing type. You're the type that, for instance, that seeks pleasure, happiness, new experiences. Okay, so extroverted means energy is directed outward toward people, to things, and you're the sensing type. You're about seeing things, hearing things, smelling things, touching things. Um, there's five senses, okay? Uh, so the extroverted sensing type is someone who does things out there, who seeks new experiences, seeks pleasure, right? The cliff jumper, looking for that ultimate rush, right? or you know, the person who needs to feel the wind on his face, right? He's extrovert, he's out there seeking experiences, right? D directing his gen energy outward, but it's about what he sees, it's about what he can touch, what he can hear, what he can smell, that's what it's about. Those people who say, you know, that, you know, they say, I gotta live, you know, I really, ha I have to live, I, I need to experience what's out there. That's the extroverted sensing type. And then there's the extroverted intuiting type, they're extroverted, extroverted, energy is directed outward, um, but it's more about using their gut feeling or, or a hunch 
It's not really about the senses. So it's a feeling directed toward the outside world, okay? That's the extroverted uh, intuiting type. They direct their feelings outward, but they'll exploit opportunities for success. They're creative. So for, for instance, the worker who knows when to kiss up to the boss and, and, when, to, uh, and when to lay low, that's, that person is the extroverted intuiting type. They use the, their extroversion, they direct their energy outward, but they use their gut and their hunch to kind of, uh, you know, figure things out. Something tells me that now is not a good time to be telling jokes. Or something tells me that now's the time. Now, now's the time when I can, I, I, I can uh, you know, seek this opportunity. Now's the time when I can really, you know, uh, explain to the boss what I'm good at, what I'm capable of, because somebody just left and I want to convince the boss that, uh, you know, I should take that position, you know. So someone who basically uses their hunch and their gut feeling uh, toward the out outside world with people, basically. And they use that to try to get ahead. That's the extroverted intuiting type. And we also have the extroverted uh, thinking type. This is the type of person that still directs their energy outward, but they're the thinking type, okay? The type of person that thinks and, you know, and, you know, and, and kind of just knows things. So they direct their thinking outward. So it's about thinking, but they direct it outward. They know things, they follow rules, they're objective. They, you know, they try to do things, uh, uh, you know, in, in a kind of an objective way, in a thing, in a way that's kind of fair, you know? So that might be, for instance, an employee who is always on time, follows the rules, is fair, does not play favorites. They're extroverted, they direct their energy outward, but they're also the thinking type. They know things, they follow rules. Um, think of it like, like that, uh, you know, that good worker, right? Who knows how to do his job, he knows things, and he follows the rules, he's on time. That's the extroverted thinking type. You know, they're smart, they, they, you know, they, they, they're always thinking, they know a lot of things. Um, but they use that knowledge uh, with people uh, kind of to, uh, you know, to, uh, to participate in, the, in, in things that have to do with people, okay? Um, it's that nerd at the office, you know? Uh, he's not introverted, he's extroverted. Talks to a lot of people, talks, talks to the boss, and he knows a lot of things, and he talks about a lot of things, and uh, he just knows a lot of things, and he follows the rules. That's the extroverted thinking. So it, it, it might be like an office nerd or something like that, okay, to put it uh, bluntly. Uh, the extroverted feeling type is someone who uh, directs their emotions outward. They're extroverted, but they're sociable and expressive, right? They're looking to feel things, okay? Um, not sense things, okay? Not outdoors, but more uh, uh, feel things. They want to feel good, okay? Uh, so the sports fan who acts wild when watching a game with friends, they're extroverted, they're hanging out with people, but they act wild, right? They want to feel good, okay? That, that's an example, that person who kind of acts out with people and they, and they show their feelings. They're very emotional and expressive, uh, but they, you know, they're with people. They like to be with people. They're extroverted. So those are four right there. Those are the four that have to do with being extroverted. And now we're going to talk about the introverted types. There's the introverted sensing type. The introverted sensing type is the type of person who directs their energy inward, okay, because it's introverted, but they're sensitive, calm, kind of detached aesthetically. It means that's to do with art, music, that kind of stuff. So it's about the senses. It's about what they can hear and touch and smell and taste. So it might be a musician, for instance, who spends hours alone, hours of, hours alone perfecting uh, his music, his or her music. So a musician, very introverted, right? They keep to themselves, but they're, you know, they keep practicing, they keep rehearsing, trying to get that perfect sound. Or it could be a chef who spends a lot of hours alone also, you know, trying to perfect that recipe. Or that person who likes to paint or draw. That's the introverted sensing type. It's about you know, it's about the senses. It's about what they see, what they hear, what they smell, they taste and touch, except that the energy is directed inward. Not outward. That would be the thrill seeker, but inward. So they, do, they do things that require spending time alone and, uh, and using the senses. And then there's the introverted intuiting type, the type that uses the hunch, the gut feeling, but it's directed inward. 
people who are visionaries, daydreamers, aloof, uh, not concerned with practical matters. So people who, are, who meditate, who seek, who seek inner peace. So they're introverted, the energy is directed inward. They prefer to be by themselves in a quiet place. But there they are meditating, daydreaming, or uh, you know, just uh, basically uh, seeking some other experience, but internally. That's the, ex the introverted intuiting type. And then there's the, um, I almost bit my tongue there. There's the introverted thinking type. The introverted thinking type is the one that basically directs their energy inward, but the thinking is directed inward. So they're concerned with abstractions, theories, they're aloof. So this would be introverted thinking type would be your philosopher who spends a lot of time considering ultimate realities thinking about the meaning of time, space, origins. It would be your scientist, you know, who basically spends a lot of time directing their thinking inward to trying to come up with that theory or trying to test some concept. Um, you know, so it, it could be a mathematician, you know. These people uh, like to spend time on their own, but they're thinking, okay? So scientists, mathematicians, philosophers, uh, things like that. As a psychologist, I can tell you that this is my strongest type. I am the introverted thinking type. I know I have to be a little bit extroverted sometimes when I have class and things like that. Via Zoom, it's not really going to happen. But in person, I kind of have to put on a little bit of a show and, and, and act differently. But I'm mostly the introverted thinking type. I, am a, I, I love philosophy and I am a scientist by nature. That's the introverted thinking type. And then there's the introverted feeling type where their feelings are directed inward. Yes, feelings are directed inward, right? It's about how they feel, but the feelings are directed inward. They're emotional, but they don't really express it. They're quiet, they're modest, right? The person who spends a lot of time dwelling on their own feelings. So that person maybe who keeps a, di a diary and writes a lot about how they feel, or they uh, maybe uh, uh, just, uh, you know, or, or the person who is like depressed, and just sits there and soaks and basically just focuses in on how awful their, their life is and doesn't talk to anybody. Um, being depressed will make you kind of the introverted feeling type. Um, but basically these are people who like to spend time on their own dwelling on their feelings. Uh, and sometimes it's, uh, sometimes it's bad feelings, but it could also be positive feelings, you know, and you don't really, share them with people but usually it's it you know it's it's um you know it's it's uh, it's a feeling let's keep going i would love to talk about this now but we'll wait until i end the recording uh there's other interesting things that are going to come up uh there's also the uh personal unconscious uh that's part of jung's uh, uh of jung's theory um so it's similar to freud um this is nothing more than the uh, than the unconscious mind, but uh, Jung called it the personal unconscious. It's your own unconscious mind. So it's like a filing cabinet, cabinet where you can store things that you're currently not thinking about, and you can bring it out of the cabinet and think about it, put it into consciousness. And then when you're done with it, you can kind of forget about it, put it back in the cabinet, okay? So your unconscious is, is, is the same thing as what Freud called, the personal unconscious is the same thing as Freud called the unconscious. Although Jung believed that we have a little bit more control over it, uh, you know, uh, whether to bring stuff in and out, bring stuff from unconscious to consciousness. So, for example, you can focus on your fear of crowds when you're in the classroom, right? Or you can forget about it and focus on the lecture instead. Okay, you can choose to, you know, leave that fear in your unconscious or you can bring it out and let it affect you. But your personal unconscious is nothing more than your unconscious mind. Same thing we talked about with regard to Freud, that information that is usually hidden, those fears, memories, motivations that are usually hidden and out of awareness. But it's, it's yours, it's personal, right? But you can also bring it out in order to use, that, uh, to use it, okay? Now, the reason that Jung called it the personal unconscious is because for Jung, um, actually, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I'll tell you that uh, what I was going to say in a moment. But there's a little bit more information about your personal unconscious. Okay, uh, the personal unconscious um, stores some experiences, and some of these experiences have to do with complexes. 
A complex is a pattern of something, something you tend to do, a, a way of thinking or feeling or carrying yourself, right? It's kind of a complex, a pattern of emotions, memories, perceptions, wishes, right? Organized around a, a common theme. They can be positive or negative, conscious or unconscious. For instance, being a perfectionist, if you're a perfectionist, that's a complex. Like you always have to do things right, or you always have to do things in a certain way. Or maybe another complex could be that you, let's say, are uh, extremely pessimistic and you always tend to see the dark side of things. You tend to always dwell on the negative. Or maybe you're an optimist and you think things are gonna work out and you just like to see the good side of people, right? But either way, it's a complex. It's a certain way in which you tend to think or behave or the way in which you perceive things uh, that comes up again and again. It, it usually has a, there's a theme to it. It's always negative and maybe always positive being, being negative or being positive, being pessimist or optimist. Um, or maybe you have a complex that has to do uh, uh, with sex, with a lot of things with you about you are, are driven with sex. You know, the way you feel, your memories, your perceptions, your wishes, your emotions, uh, what you seek in life, right? That could be a complex. Okay, so a complex is just something, a pattern of doing things, a pattern of thinking, of behaving. It's a complex. And you can see how that is definitely personality. Uh, let's keep going. Uh, and then there's also the collective unconscious. Uh, this is what I was going to say earlier. So Jung called the unconscious the personal unconscious because it's your own. Uh, weird thing about Jung is that he also believes that we have a collective unconscious. We have an unconscious mind that we share with others, that we are somehow connected to our ancestors through our collective unconscious. It's a collection of experiences of past generations. That is the collective unconscious. We inherit predispositions, ideas, you know, certain ways of thinking, feeling, and behaving that was important to our ancestors. Like your predisposition, for instance, to believe in a God. It might have been important for your ancestors, and you've inherited that according to Jung. And therefore, God is important in your life today. It's part of your collective unconscious. It's a kind of a mind that you share with others, that we are connected in some kind of mystic way uh, with other people the people that we are related to with our ancestors. Uh, another example uh, of that uh, would be uh, what a lot of Na Native Americans believe in, when Native Americans who believe in these things called uh, like visions, where they have some kind of dream, and in that dream they have a vision that helps them understand you know, something about what they're currently experiencing, or maybe something about the past, helps them understand something about the past, or maybe help them understand or, or try to help them predict the future. And in that vision, they will encounter usually some ancestor of theirs, usually in some animal form, in some spirit form. And in that way, they believe they are connected to their ancestors, uh, you know, in their mind, so to speak, and that helps them. Uh, it, it helps them, you know, uh, with visions and quests and just to understand things. That would be a perfect example of the collective unconscious. Sounds a bit mystical and weird, but, Jung believed that such a thing exists. That's the collective unconscious. Uh, there is actually, there may be some evidence for that. Research is showing that, um, for instance, that if your ancestors uh, long ago, like, uh, uh, you know, experienced something like a famine where they, uh, they almost starved to death, you know, where food was scarce, um, that research is showing that that can actually affect people, you know, even three or maybe even four generations later because the experience actually alters you biologically, alters your genetic, and then that gets passed on. And then generations later, you can be more susceptible to certain illnesses or stress because your ancestors had to go through that thing because of what they went through, that trauma. Let's keep going. Uh, the collective unconscious also contains these things called archetypes. Archetypes are basically, uh, you know, images, uh, uh, from uh, that have to do with the past. Images of universal experiences that have been repeated over generations and are expressed in our dreams and fantasies. Archetypes are ideas, are old ideas that seem to have always been around and they have to do with the distant past. Like there's the archetype of the hero. The idea of the hero has been around for a long time. You know, the hero is usually someone who is male, you know, someone who is uh, masculine, muscular, 
uh, and, uh, and brave and things like that. But the idea of the mother, like the, the image of what a stereotypical mother is like, you know, uh, big bosom, big hips, you know, middle age kind of, uh, you know, uh, a little bit on the heavy side, right? The idea of the child or the idea of God, what God is like, right? And what God is, that's an idea that's been around for a long time, right? A lot of people believe in God and God is almost always a male that's kind of muscular and thin and, uh, you know, long hair and, and wise and caring and all that stuff. That's an idea that's been around for a very, very long time. Uh, the idea of death, you know, the grim reaper and stuff like that, power, the wise old man, mother nature. These are the ideas have been around forever. And according to Jung, that's evidence of the collective unconscious. We've inherited these ideas and we tend to continue to believe in things in this way. Let's keep going. Other interesting things that have to do with the collective unconscious. Uh, it contains, uh, you know, uh, what we call major archetypes, archetypes, archetypes right? Um, here's the thing, um, there's something known as the persona. According to Jung, there is a mask that we all wear in public, and that is called the persona. It's a mask that we all wear to deceive others, but it can also deceive ourselves, okay? Like in public, we may present ourselves as maybe the perfect parent or a hard worker or an honest person, um, a reasonable person, a nice person. But in reality, we may be very different, okay? But we all wear a mask. We wanna, you know, like, you know, I wear a mask. You know, when I teach, I present myself as this person who, you know, who knows a lot and who is caring, you know, and, uh, and thoughtful and fair and things like that. But that's also part of my mask. Um, you know, I can also be mean. I can be unreasonable and I can get very upset and cuss and be awful. But in public, I have to show my good side. I have to, you know, it's that mask, right, that we wear. I'll give you another example. Um, those performers, those musicians that a lot of you fall in love with, that is not who they are. That is a mask they wear in public. That is their persona. That is the person that they act like. They, that they act that way so that people will, uh, will uh, basically admire them and fall in love with them and buy their music and watch their movies. But according to Jung, we all wear this mask. For some of us, the mask is closer to who we really are. And for others, the mask is really different from who we really are, uh, you know, when we're alone. But when we're in public, we show a certain side of ourselves to people or we show something to people that can be very different from the truth. So that's the persona. We all wear this mask, okay? We're all kind of putting on a show, putting on an act to some extent. We also have the animus and the anima. The animus is the masculine side of you. According to Jung, we all are masculine in some way, whether you're male or female, you have a masculine side, a strong side of you, a side of you, a side of you that's aggressive, that's assertive, that's gonna push back. And we also have a feminine side that's called the, uh, the anima, uh, which is basically uh, the, um, you know, the side of you that is kind and nurturing and more feminine. That's associated with being more feminine. I know these sound like stereotypes, but this is what Jung believed, that we have a masculine and a feminine side. Okay, all of us, you know, even males, you have a feminine side. No matter how tough, how macho you think you are, you have a feminine side. We must express both if we're gonna be well-adjusted. We can't always be macho and tough and assertive. Sometimes we have to, you know, we have to use our feminine side and we have to be kind and nurturing and listen to people and things like that. It's very unhealthy to be completely masculine. And it's also very unhealthy to be completely feminine. And research, modern research supports that. A person can be both nurturing and assertive, nice and aggressive. So that's the animus and the anima. And let's see how we're doing on time. There is also, uh, oh, here's some pictures for you guys to make this point very clear. These musicians, these artists that you guys fall in love with, right? There's Lady Gaga right there. These may be a bit outdated, um, but there's Lady Gaga there. I don't even know who, I remember who that is. That's Little Kim or something. There's Beyonce. Uh, I was trying to be inclusive here, uh, but not just having, uh, you know, not just, uh, I mean, yeah, black, white people, Latinos, all that stuff. There's, uh, what's her name? Um, Shakira, okay? 
Look at Shakira right there. Look at these people, right? You think that's who they really are? They, they exude sexuality. You know? Look at right there, Katy Perry, uh, Snoop Dogg. Right there. I'll tell you something about Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg is more like the real deal. Who he shows you is closer to who he really uh, is. He's a guy who really loves weed and, and, and is kind of low key. That's really who he is. And he shows you that. So his mask is closer to who he really is. But look at these other guys over here, this rock group, this from the 80s, right? Uh, what's that called? Uh, Twisted Sister, the guy there. What the hell's his name? I forget his name. Uh, uh, doesn't matter. But that's a show. That's an act. All these people are putting on a show and an act, so to speak. Snoop Dogg's a little bit more real, but they do this to sell records, to sell music. So you'll watch their movies. These are all musicians here, right? I can tell you that um, Shakira, you know, is... Uh, a pretty ordinary Latina. You should see how she started off. She didn't look like that at all. <laughs> she was your ordinary, average looking Latina, mild mannered, and they turned her into this superstar, right? And now she has to be super sexy and show lots of skin and be wild and she sings about things, you know, um, that really don't reflect necessarily who she is. I don't claim to know her, but I know how she started out. Okay, but yes, the industry will turn you into this showpiece, right? So that you can sell and be attractive and alluring. It's, it's, it's business, but you can be a very different person, uh, you know, uh, behind closed doors. And that is the mask, that is the persona. We all do this to some extent, we all wear a mask. Some of us are real phony and we show something that is very different from who we really are. And some of us are in the middle and some of us show more of our true self. I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I like to believe I'm more genuine, but my wife would say that, yeah, I'm, I'm awful sometimes. And I do agree with her. Sometimes I can be mean and, you know, not very reasonable. Um, more about the collective unconscious. There is also the shadow. Okay, the shadow is very interesting. That's that part of you that, that lives in the unconscious. It's a part of you that's like the animal side of you, the primitive side of you that can be evil and immoral. You must tame your shadow so you can function well within society. But your shadow is also the source of vitality, the source of energy, spontaneity, creativity, and emotion. The shadow basically is like when you express your wild side to have fun. You decide you're gonna express your wild side. You're gonna go crazy and you're gonna drink and smoke and have sex and do whatever the hell you want. That's you behaving like an animal. That's you expressing your shadow. Think of it like your id. Jung calls it the shadow. We all have it. It can be evil, it can be aggressive and immoral and lusty and, and, and all sorts of things, but it is the part of you that's primitive and acts like an animal, but it is where your creativity comes from. It's where your spontaneity comes from. If you wanna have fun, you have to let go. You have to let loose and just go with what your body wants, okay? You wanna be spontaneous, right? Hey man, let's get the hell out of here and let's just take a road trip right now, let's go, right? All right, don't pack anything. Just get your wallet and let's go, right? Or get your purse and let's go. That's expressing your shadow. But it can also be the source of evil and aggression and things that are wrong, right? Some people express that too much and they get into trouble. You have to tame it. You have to keep it under control. But every now and then you can let it out and let loose so you can have some fun. There's also self. Self is part of the collective unconscious. Self is more something that you strive for, right? To be complete, unity, integration, harmony that the psyche strives for, right? It requires integration of conscious and unconscious motives. So if you can integrate all these things, your shadow, uh, you know, your, uh, your persona, the different psychological uh, types, um, you know, all these different things, uh, you know, uh, yourself, uh, then you can achieve unity. You can achieve uh, self, right? Where you are complete, you have actualized, you are living at your full potential. But yes, there's a lot of different parts of you that are there vying for your attention and your ego determines which one you let out, so to speak. But the self is when you integrate and everything works in harmony and you're well adjusted. But some of us may be a little bit too wild, too crazy. Some of us are a bit too controlled. Some of us a bit maybe too fake, um, but uh, you need, uh, yeah, or too feminine, too masculine. All these things need to be kind of in balance and used harmoniously as the situation calls for them. And uh, you know, we will stop there. Let me stop the recording.